the whole future. So it's commonly accepted that the human brain is a meat computer processing inputs and outputs. And on face value, that just sounds, meh, you kind of brush it off. But when you look deep into that, that's really trippy. So let's just look at the three basic inputs. So sight, sound, and I guess touch. So your eyes are basically just taking in photons that are bouncing off all these different objects. Um, they're hitting your eyes, they're hitting photoreceptors in your eyes, which is then being converted into electrical signals that get sent to the brain. Your ear is basically just picking up vibrations in the air, which are then vibrating the, the eardrum, and then a few like inner ears, and then like a whole bunch of steps until it basically hits a nerve, which again sends a signal to the brain. And obviously touch, like when you touch your skin, all that's doing is really touching a nerve, which is then sending electrical signal back to the brain. It's analog signals, it's not digital, it's not ones and zeros, but it's still electrical signals. Obviously there's a bunch of other inputs like, you know, taste, smell, um, kind of like your inertia, things like that. Um, but ultimately they're all just being converted into electrical signals that are sent to the brain and then processed. The way your brain processes these inputs in and kind of like finds patterns is literally the basis for your entire reality, your entire consciousness, your entire identity, your behavior, everything. I actually have kind of a bit of a bizarre theory that our consciousness and our identity is completely an illusion. It's literally just the inputs that we received over our lifetimes built up into certain patterns. I mean, you think of like how children and babies learn languages, how we learn languages. Like it's just uh, repetitive inputs which creates a repetitive electrical pulse which creates a strengthened neural pathway. So when I say the word cats, you instantly understand the abstract version of what I mean. And this is how we have the basis of language and memes and all that sort of thing. Because every time you've heard the word cat, that strengthened a particular neural pathway. As a toddler learning language for the first time, you would have been shown pictures of cats, or you would have touched cats, or you would have, you know, your, your parents would have pointed at a cat and said the word cat. So it's pairing the inputs with that word. The more and more that input comes in, obviously it just keeps flowing down that same type of neural pathway. Like that pathway might change a bit, but obviously it'll take the, the path of least resistance, which creates this connectome in the brain. So the point with all this is really to bring up this idea that isn't new, it's been kind of popularized by Ray Kurzweil, who's like a famous futurist, he's a director of engineering, where he says that VR is going to become completely immersive. Most people when they think of virtual reality now, they basically think of those, you know, what, what's basically coming out now, the, the, the Oculus, the Gear VR, the, the Vive, where it's just a bulky headset you put on your head. Essentially all those headsets are doing is really just like intercepting the photons you normally receive from reality and then just passing a new set of photons, thus creating a new reality. Now the only way to make these headsets more and more realistic is to basically decrease the size of the pixels so you're getting a really kind of like, you know, photorealistic view of the world, photorealistic photo. But it's inevitable that like rather than trying to basically send more and more light through that, through that eye, more simulated light, more simulated photons, why not just directly send electrical currents through that optic nerve? If everything you see is, is quite literally just an electrical stimulation, then all you need to do to create photorealistic, immersive reality in any form is to just send a different signal. And so here's the product roadmap to get there. So we've got virtual reality headsets coming out. Obviously, that will get smaller and smaller and, and more portable. We've got augmented reality headsets coming out, and same thing, they'll get smaller and smaller and more portable. AR and VR will then merge into a single headset, so imagine just a very type of thin piece of glass where you can instantly switch between full VR or, or basically AR with holograms over reality. And then those glasses will be paired with like really, really tiny earplugs that we put into both our ears that basically help us intercept and replace audio. And if you look at what iPhone's just done with the, with the wireless earbuds, that's a good trend. But the next step after that is obviously these glasses need to start reading brain activity because, you know, gestures and voice uh, kind of inputs and controls is very limited. You'd rather just read directly from... And so they'll inevitably work out a way to include some type of like portable EEG or EMG, like using magnetic resonance or electrical resonance to read the brain activity, and they'll be directly in the glasses. But then obviously from outside the skull, it's like very hard to read, you know, the fine-tuned um, electrical activity. You want to read down to the neural level, basically, every single neural firing. So that's when you start exploring things like brain-computer interfaces, almost like brain impl implants, things like the neural lace, which Elon Musk is working on, or some type of thing where you inject it through the jugular and it unfurls in the brain. At that point, you've got very high-resolution kind of reading of the brain, so you can start to predict what people want without even having to ask them. You can start doing telepathy without even having to ask them. And if you can read people's thoughts and their questions and their problems um, and what they want, and you pair that to this completely almost near-immersive VR and AR world, if you can read someone's brain activity uh, fairly accurately and then pair that through a feedback loop to intercepting their visual information, their visual inputs, and their auditory inputs, you can give them what they want. At that point, every single individual on the planet has a completely personalized, customized reality um, that's delivered to them on demand. If you want something to appear in front of you, all you do is literally think of it and instantly it appears. I mean, you wouldn't quite be able to interact with it because you're only intercepting uh, the audio and visual at this point. At this stage, which is maybe like less than 10 years away at this stage, um, you kind of like, your reality in terms of visual and auditory is indistinguishable from current reality. Because it won't feel completely immersive because you'll still be completely aware that you're wearing these glasses and you're wearing these earplugs 
even if your brain activity is being red. I mean, if you take the glasses off, you're back to bland, normal reality. But those AR VR glasses obviously become contact lenses that can do the exact same thing and, and at a more higher resolution. And those kind of earphone earplugs almost become just little like implants. But then consumers will start demanding our uh, right abilities. So the implants, the neural lace, the brain computer interface will be readability. Next, you just need to make it right. And all that means is that rather than reading the electrical activity, those implants, the neural lace, whatever, they're basically just sending electrical activities into the brain, pulsing it, which is basically sending new reality. And at that point, you don't need the contact lenses, you don't need the uh, ear implants, you don't even need whatever haptic suits people are wearing, because you can just send every electrical activity directly into the brain. If you want 100% fully immersive virtual reality to the point where you're like, you're not even sure if you're in real reality, you literally would be in a simulation, all you need to do is block all the inputs you're currently receiving, like I'm receiving right now, you're receiving right now, block all of those, and then just replace them with a brand new set of inputs. If we still have biological bodies, if we're still in biological form at that stage, it's probably a good idea we put a time limit on the amount of time people can spend in these virtual worlds, because it'd be addictive. But AR would be completely fine, I mean, you'd basically be walking through reality, you'd be interacting with people, you'd be avoiding objects, um, but perhaps your reality is an entirely blue avatar world. <laughs> and in either of these realities, the entities, the people that you in interact with, they could be artificial, they could be recordings, or they could be live. You wouldn't know the difference. <laughs> And this brings up an idea that I've had for a while in terms of life logging, um, because imagine everyone records absolutely everything they see and do. Imagine life is just recorded in full immersive reality. The moment everything is recorded, every spatial environment, every 3D environment, every conversation, every historical event, you now can travel back in time. It wouldn't be traveling back in time in terms of like, you know, breaking any type of space-time continuum or, you know, breaking any rules of physics, but you quite literally would feel like you're actually traveled back in time. Because imagine if we had, like, uh, for the past hundred years, everyone's been recording absolutely everything, and we have this technology where we can basically intercept people's realities and put them into these new virtual or augmented reality worlds. So to travel back in time, literally all you do is you take that recording and you just basically replace your current reality with the inputs of that recording. So now you feel like you've actually stepped into the past, you're in that world. You could be a passive bystander and kind of like travel back to that, that past reality and just kind of sit there and watch what happens. You can sit on the couch, you can sit on the chair. You'd feel like you're actually there, but you're just watching it kind of unfurl. But say you want to go back in time and basically kill Hitler. Well, so if you had the recordings of his entire life and it was all mapped out, you could go back and then actually make that decision and then everything from that point on is a simulation. <laughs> and so that brings up the idea of simulation theory. I mean, when we talk about simulation theory, I, I think we kind of tend to think of like, okay, we make a simulated universe, but we wouldn't be in that universe, just these other entities we make. Well, the idea of parallel universes, we tend to think of that as like a, a very natural, universal, physics-based thing. You know, we're like, okay, there's a parallel universe, but it's obviously like going to be made of atoms and stuff like that, yeah? But if this reality is merely how you perceive it based on the electrical activity and processes in your brain, and you go back in the past and do the, basically replace those inputs with, you know, these past inputs, and then you make that decision where you're like, okay, I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to kill Hitler. <laughs> okay, so obviously that didn't happen in our reality, but in that reality it did. Now you've created parallel universes. Sure, it's a simulated parallel universe, but it's a parallel universe nonetheless. Like, um, you potentially could trap that human, that, that entity, in that new reality. <laughs> and that entity or that person quite literally wouldn't know that they were in a simulation. It's, it's, it would be quite literally the Matrix level stuff, where you're just literally replacing the inputs with something else, and you're unaware of it. The next product iteration after Neural Lace and this brain-computer kind of interface and implants and stuff like that will obviously be nanobots, which go through the jugular and they just wrap every individual neuron so they can read and write at a neural level. And because at this point, you've, you're basically reading and writing in the human brain at the neural level. And because all the neurons in your brain are then now connected and networked, and you've networked all the other human brains, you've quite literally created a super artificial intelligence, a super collective hive mind artificial intelligence comprised of 100 billion neurons in each of our brains times 7 or 10 billion people. And once you've wrapped every neuron in every human brain, you, the merge is complete. I mean, the biological, fact, the biological body does not matter anymore because you're basically recording every single piece of neural activity or inputs and outputs. If you map the connectome at the neural level and you're actually recording all inputs and outputs very quickly, like within, you know, t days almost, you've got a very accurate algorithm that is you, your identity, your behaviours. At that point, you're able to basically create near-infinite digital copies of yourself uh, that are running in all sorts of simulations, um, and at that point, the biological body becomes completely irrelevant. Moore's Law is actually the fifth paradigm of computing, and it's been on an, a steady exponential rise since the 1900s, and just extrapolating that out another 25 years means that the computers will be the size of red blood cells. And so many prominent technologists and futurists, and kind of including myself, um, if you, everything I've talked about, and Moore's Law, and you tie it all together, they predict it's going to happen within 30 years at Futur.